Olá, a IUPAP, International Union for Pure and Applied Physics, está interessada em muitas coisas. Dentre elas, a definição das unidades básicas que nós usamos no dia a dia, a manutenção das constantes fundamentais, mas também está muito interessada nos desafios que a ciência tem atualmente. Na área da física são muitos os desafios. Nós temos desafios desde o entendimento das partículas elementares, da matéria condensada, na física nuclear, é, na biofísica, na astrofísica. Em todas as áreas, ou sub-áreas da física, nós temos desafios. Para que você saiba quais são esses desafios, a IUPAP organizou um workshop especial que chama-se Entendendo os Desafios da Física Moderna. Cada área da física está aqui é, sendo apresentada por um líder, membro da IUPAP, e que você terá então agora a chance de entender, através desta apresentação, os desafios que a área apresenta e como os físicos, de um modo geral, estão superando esses desafios para que a física seja um instrumento de entendimento das ciências naturais e que auxilie o homem não apenas a avançar o seu conhecimento, mas a tornar a ciência um instrumento útil da melhoria de vida de cada um existente nesse planeta e nesse universo. Assista e também faça parte do entendimento dos desafios da física moderna. Boa sorte! Next speaker is uh, Deborah Kane. She is going to tell us about laser physics and photonics. Um, the first thing I would like to say is just to um, point out a few of the things that are in the report uh, from Commission C-17, Laser Physics and Photonics. Um, so, you know, it's good to remind ourselves of just what a successful event the International Year of Light was. Uh, so there's a bit about that in our report. Um, we gave a report about some of the th highlights in the field over the triennium, uh, and I'll talk about it. Um, one of those today, but there's no time to go through them all. And one of the things that we report there as well is looking at the metrics for um, publications in laser physics and photonics separately uh, and together. And what that shows is that the field is growing on that metric, and we would believe it's growing on other metrics as well. So, uh, and also the metric of the high impact publication in the areas is also growing. So we think the area is in good health. Uh, and uh, there's, there's some of those things you can read more about uh, if you wish. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is something outside of my area, but the observation of uh, gravity waves uh, in well, the observation being made in 2015 and reported in, in 2016 and just receiving the Nobel Prize uh, on the 3rd of October is an astounding success for science and because a large part of that if sits in laser physics and photonics then I have asked a couple of colleagues to provide me with some resources to talk a little bit about that here today and I'm going to contrast that with some of my own work which is a bit of a risk obviously um, but in terms terms of being a tabletop uh, small group research scientist and a research and teaching academic, uh, then the, one of the challenges that we see, and particularly in areas like laser photonics, uh, laser physics and photonics, is that it is more challenging to maintain small-scale physics as more of our funding is maybe concentrated into large-scale projects. So I think this is an opportunity to remind ourselves that this very diverse and broad range of activities is actually important to us uh, as a community overall. And I'll just touch on the things that we are doing uh, at the moment very briefly and I also warn you that I know I've got too many slides and I'm probably going to do a bit of a whiz through at points to stay on time.
Okay, so the Nobel Prize in Physics for Gravity Wave Detection that went to uh, Ray Weiss and Barry, Barry Barish and uh, Kip Thorne, uh, it, this is a phenomenal uh, achievement, but as there was a lot of discussion that giving the prize to just three people in an area where, as Ray Weiss noted, that uh, it's been 40, that, that the 2015 detection was the culmination of decades of work involving more than a thousand scientists, it's as long as 40 years of pe people thinking about this, trying to make a detection, sometimes failing, and then slowly but surely getting the technology to give it to be able to do it. So this has been a massive effort by a lot of people uh, to get to this detection. Uh, and in the slides that I will be showing you, I want to acknowledge uh, colleagues at the Australian National University, David McClellan, Bram Slagmolin, and Robert Ward, who've provided slides to me, and also uh, Dr. Ben O'Wilkie, leader of the Advanced LIGO Laser Development Project, who provided slides after having been asked indirectly by Peter Veach from the University of Adelaide, and I'm very grateful to them for the resources. But my own uh, exposure to gravity waves started back in 1984 when in the postdoc project that I was working on I was visiting the lab of Professor Jim Hoff at the University of Glasgow uh, in order to discuss um, a particular piece of uh, equipment and technology that I was using in the project I was working on at the time. But it was a, a, my first time to have a look around the uh, test bed gravity wave interferometer that they had in the lab there at that time. I also uh, met Norna Robertson, who was uh, Jim Hoff's right-hand person at the time, uh, and I'll come back to her uh, a little bit later on. But from that interaction with seeing this challenge that was being uh, set and what an enormously um, in inspirational idea it was, and with all the expectation that it was actually going to be much too difficult to ever be realized, but that has been an interest to me the whole time through, and mostly where I've ex expressed that is in teaching. Okay, so gravity wave detection has been one of the subjects that I've chosen to include in uh, special courses for um, in interested and advanced students. It is one of those very exciting ideas that, it's, that our students get very excited about, and so that was my first exposure. But what is the challenge? So the challenge of detecting a gravity wave from a laser physics and photonics point of view is what Rye Weiss called the 10 to the 12 problem, but that's being extended to the 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13, or 10 to the 14 problem, where in order to measure the change in length that a gravity wave causes on an interferometer of the scale of those uh, at LIGO, you have to be able to measure one 10 to the 12th of an interference fringe at a wavelength of about a micron. And thinking about that, you can see why 50 years ago, when people first started talking about this, people said it was, would be impossible. I mean, that is an incredible technical challenge. And additionally, because things aren't just moving around because of the gravity wave, you've got things moving around because of uh, seismic uh, and thermal noise sources, then you also have another 10 to the 12 problem as to how you quieten everything down so that you can see your gravity wave. So these are incredible challenges. And I also think it's interesting that um, Ray Weiss had the idea for the interferometer in a teaching context, okay? He was thinking of interesting problems for his students, and it was in that context that he first started thinking about interferometers for gravity wave detection, and we know where that has got us to. So I'm not talking so much about the gravity waves because I'm concentrating on the laser physics and the photonics, but the effect of a gravity wave on an interferometer no, I don't. Okay. is uh, to uh, the two orthogonal arms. It's based on a Michelson interferometer, so interferometer arms that are at right angles, and that when the gravity wave passes through, it squeezes, shortens one length and stretches the other. So the, the small difference in length that you get is doubled by the difference uh, in the two arms. And with doing some calculations, then you're talking about needing masses of about 40 kilograms and path lengths in your interferometer arms of about four kilometers. 
And the instruments that we know that exist now aren't at all like the laboratory photo that I showed you, but they are uh, the um, H1 and L1 uh, in the States. and come on, has come online since uh, the first detection, Virgo, and Kagra in Japan is under construction. Okay, and with an expectation that we'll have an even number, larger number of gravity wave detector interferometers in the world when LIGO India, India uh, gets built. So this field is only going to grow. So what do you have to do with these interferometers? Well, the diagram on the right here is telling you what needs to be done. This is looking at the strain noise, so a lower level here means the interferometer will be more sensitive at that frequency. And of course, a major advantage of interferometric uh, gravity wave detectors is that they are, allow a range of frequencies to be detected as opposed to the resonant bars, uh, which are tuned to particular frequencies. And so you have uh, the shot noise here associated with how powerful your laser is. You have the thermal noise associated with how um, quiet things are and the seismic noise at lower frequencies on, on how still things are. And the, I'm going to whiz through a few of the sort of uh, technological developments that have actually allowed the gravity wave to be detected. But this is the uh, sensitivity curve for the last science run of initial LIGO. And you can see that in terms of being able to make the detections that are now being made ever more commonly, that needed to s push the sensitivity down uh, to these lower levels. And in this case, pushing the shot noise down is related to increasing the power of the lasers. So here we have gravity wave interferometry as a driver for uh, some very nice developments in lasers. Okay, there was a time about 20 years ago in solid state laser development when the most uh, challenging and, and advancing uh, developments were being pushed by the specs required by gravity wave interferometers. Okay, the work that was being done in more industrial contexts wasn't getting the same kind of drive towards the best that we could do. So I think this is, you know, so these science challenges as a driver for really pushing the specs of what we achieve with our instruments uh, is a key uh, thing, benefit to hang on to. And so for advanced LIGO, they needed to push the laser power up to 200 watts, which is actually really, really high. Okay, so that's a very uh, difficult laser to run in the very stable way that's required, narrow line width, very stabilized frequency, very stabilized power, very stabilized pointing direction. These are all incredible uh, science and technical challenges. I'm gonna skip that one. Okay, so this is the scaling up from uh, LIGO, which was, had at most 20 watts, and in terms of the developments in the actual interferometer, to get the power up even further, then you're using very high finesse uh, cavities here uh, between the test end mass and the uh, test input mass, so that starting off with 20 watts, you then have 100 kilowatts circulating in that part of the interferometer. Now with the 165, 180 watts, you're getting up to 800 kilowatts. So this is a lot of power to have circulating uh, inside an interferometer. Now if you take a look at the actual laser, thank you, I'm going to have to speed up now, I'm going to skip lots of slides, uh, then you need to you can start off here with a non-planar ring laser. You have several stages of um, amplification, you have mode cleaning and stabilization. These are incredibly um, sophisticated laser designs, which it is amazing that people manage to get them to lock. And I'm going to skip the details of all of those parts uh, and go straight uh, to the overall system, which you can see here uh, shows you the laser uh, sitting on the bench and two of these, one delivered to um, Livingston, one to uh, Hanford. So they are uh, very interesting systems. And if we want to get even more different events being detected, then we have to push this technology even further. So this is showing um, sort of LIGO versus advanced LIGO through to where people are working now. So the, as the 
continued development of appropriate lasers for the next generation are underway now, uh, and they involve some very interesting ideas. So uh, different wavelengths, fiber amplifiers, uh, which give you different changes in the noise sources and give you much quieter operation through the frequencies that are of interest. And also changing the actual laser mode that you use in the uh, laser to a Lagur-Gauss higher order mode. Lots and lots of PhDs are being done on things like this at the moment uh, to develop these sources that will enable even further improvement in the detection uh, in the gravity wave interferometers. Uh, in order, to, we've talked about the shot noise, which you address by increasing the power. The seismic noise is not really in um, lasers so much. That's more in terms of the mechanics of the suspensions of the mirrors, but you do then use lasers for alignment and for stabilization of those uh, things. So, and I come back to um, Norna Robertson, who I met in Jim Hoff's lab back in 1984, uh, is now the lead scientist of the suspensions uh, team and has a joint appointment across Caltech uh, and Glasgow. Uh, and that team, uh, she proudly talks about uh, being half female, but when everybody's got their uh, gear on, you can't really tell what gender people are, and maybe that's what we should do to address the gender gap. I don't know. Okay. The actual test masses are incredible bits of optics. The mechanics people think of them as masses, but of course they are the mirrors of the interferometer, so they have to have uh, incredible specs. And as people are pushing the power up, then they're discovering that, in, in fact, you're getting new sources of noise in terms of the molecular movement of the molecules in the coatings. So new science is emerging uh, to be explored uh, in those cases. Okay, so suspensions, I'm just gonna flash a few pictures. So you can see the actual um, complexity and what has had to be um, ex uh, invest researched scientifically and then turned into engineering solutions for this phenomenal piece of equipment. Uh, and there's a number of uh, additional systems in here that facilitate the alignment uh, and locking of the interferometer. And some of that comes from the colleagues at ANU who I got these slides from. So the lock acquisition system comes from ANU and the, I'm coming up to showing you the arm cavities here uh, and the, uh, the interferometer inner workings and the recycling cavities. Uh, and this is a rather nice um, video uh, which Robert Ward was able to make in the control room at LIGO and this shows lock being achieved, I hope. I'm used to a mouse, I'm not being able to... Is it gonna play? I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get this to play, which would be a great shame. I'm sorry, I don't understand. Oh, okay, okay. So, okay, so it's not going to play, but what this actually shows is that you find that the um, displays here are live, and you see the sensitivity change uh, as it's trying to acquire lock. You see the spot from the output of the interferometer being very bright to begin with, and as it acquires lock, you see it uh, disappearing to a black screen such that it will only uh, show a signal at that point if a gravity wave event or some other seismic event is actually registering. Okay. So that gives you a bit of a sense, and just to note that with initial LIGO, it would not have been possible to detect uh, the first gravity wave detected. So all of the advances that were made and implemented in advanced LIGO did actually enable that detection to occur, which was good news for the people who took initial LIGO offline in order to do the um, upgrade. Just, we've been talking a little bit about the interaction between social sciences uh, and uh, physics, and it's interesting that there has been a sociologist working alongside the LIGO group or the precursors to it, the people in the field, for about 40 years. And he's written a series of books which I actually find quite interesting. So if people are wanting to look at what the positive interactions between uh, the social sciences and uh, physics can be, I'd recommend you take a look at Harry Collins's books because they give a bit of insight to that. So now I'm going to talk very, very quickly 
uh, about a couple of things that I do in um, my lab with, with the people who work with me. And first of all, wanting to emphasize the diversity. And diversity to me in physics means many things. It means the people. So these are some of the people I've been working with uh, in research in recent times. It means diversity in the actual projects that you do. I probably do an unusually broad range of things in the research that I'm pursuing with, with the group at the moment. Uh, and it means diversity in the equipment that you do. And I find increasingly I am learning more about other techniques that we work with through collaboration that actually enhance what we can do uh, in our work by adopting uh, those measurements as well. And so what, are we, what sorts of things are we doing? Well, we're using optical surface profilers to do phase measurements. And these, if you know the geometry of um, nanoparticles, you can actually use a optical microscope-based um, um, surface profiler to measure the, the radius of um, cylindrical nanowires. And we showed with this method that you could measure nanowires of the order of 50 to 100 nanometers to within four nanometers, uh, which was compared with um, SEM results. So uh, in, in, in terms of that's the instrument we use. We also use that instrument to uh, help a colleague out who was doing VUV spectroscopy. And I had a problem that in a VUV spectrometer, if you have a grating of a certain height, then you're meant to have a wavelength null. So a region and wavelength where you actually lose signal. And the colleague knew the approximate height of their grating step but had no null in their spectra. And with the surface profiler, we were able to do um, broad area, sorry, broad area measurements of the actual height of the grooves in the grating and showed that the width of variation in the heights actually spread things out. So it was quite uh, understandable why there was no null uh, in the um, detection. Uh, wavelength range for the spectrometer. Uh, we work with uh, museums to look at using laser conservation techniques in addressing some of the conservation problems of Aboriginal bark paintings and other objects of cultural heritage. There's some really nice problems there with you know, good science, I think, uh, behind them so that these projects work both on a science basis uh, and, and a help, helping um, society basis. Uh, we look at the optical characteristics of certain spider silks. Spider silks are actually an amazing self-assembled protein nanocomposite optical material, which we now know quite a lot about because we've been studying it now for about 10 years. And the number of things that we have to explore here just keeps growing. Uh, and it's uh, sorry, I haven't got more time to tell you more about it. Uh, but these are we get, we get to know the actual spiders as well because we share the um, laboratory of uh, Professor Murray Herberstein in biological science who keeps these little critters uh, and we can get them to make webs for us just by turning the lights on at the right time in the morning. And I won't have time to say anything about that. Uh, and finally, uh, what has probably been my main area of research for the longest time is looking at um, the physics of uh, semiconductor lasers aiming to tailor their spectra in the early days, but now our research is focused more on uh, developing methods for actually quantifying complexity in the output of nonlinear laser systems, and I haven't got time to tell you about a whole range of different ways, uh, different systems, in this particular example, a laser with, op sorry, sorry. Uh, with time-delayed optical feedback, just by varying the strength of this feedback, this laser system can give you anything from CW output through to highly chaotic output, and you have a strong amount of ability to actually control uh, the, the coherence, if you like, but also the, the level of um, um, chaos the complexity of the chaos in the system. And we have pioneered using generating very, very large data sets. So we, for a map of this sort, we would be varying uh, the laser current in about um, a thousand steps. We'd be varying the feedback level in several hundred steps. We're collecting time series of very long length so that you can do appropriate uh, statistical physics calculations on them to quantify their complexity. 
and from this we actually get um, quite new, a lot of new insights into the range of dynamics you get from these systems. So that gives you just a bit of a flavour of some of the things that we do uh, and I hope that that has helped you to see a little bit more about what goes on in laser physics and photonics. Thank you. Thank you very much. So you mentioned that with increasing the power of the lasers, uh, effects such as the molecular movement of the, of the atoms in the surface of the mirrors will be important. But those effects are already there, right? Because the, the mirrors are at a given temperature. I don't know which one, but then the, the thermal and the Heisenberg principle and the thermal movement is already there. So how? Do they go around with that? Because you have to measure something which is smaller than a proton size. With, with I mean, I, I didn't talk about the suspensions because they're mechanics more than laser physics. But you know, they, they have these very sophisticated um, several stages of suspension, and basically the in, the test masses hang off sort of half millimeter wide glass fibers, and they're using very very low loss materials to make those fibres. They actually draw them themselves and they have to be annealed and polished. Um, so, you know, there's an, it, it would take weeks to talk about no, the... But, but, but what I mean is, I mean, the thermal movement of the atoms, I mean, the atoms in the surface of the mirror, there are at, I don't know, nitrogen temperature, whatever, yeah. this is cool, but still there you have... Uh, so the lock systems are based on, you know, actually, you know, you might vibrate things a little bit and then that enables you to actually have a feedback system where you compensate for such movement. Yeah. Uh, any other question or comment? Okay, I don't see any hands, so let's thank the speaker once again. Thank you.